Bartlett, United States Army, Vietnam. Mark is one of my many Vietnam veterans. I had the pleasure of meeting him and his wife, Sandy, in Phoenix, Arizona. It was July 13, 2006, it's been a number of years ago. Mark was 59 years old at this interview. During this interview, he's now in his 70s, still with us, and uh, an excellent man, excellent story about his service in Vietnam. He was served with Alpha Company, 1st Cavalry Division, 8th Cavalry, the Air Mobile Division, and uh, he has a very unique story like all these veterans do, folks. And if you're a Vietnam veteran watching these stories and would consider being interviewed, I, I'm, I'm looking at going out into the country again this year. I haven't done it for a number of years, but I'm looking to do some more interviews. So you can contact me through my website, call me, or send me an email, and I'd be glad to speak with you about that. So the possibility of how we can maybe set that up. But I want to thank Jim Brown. Jim, God bless you. I want to salute you. Thank you for... Uh, making it possible for others to hear and to learn from Mark's story today. Jim stepped forward and is one of my sponsors. And uh, thank you for your patriotism, your service to our country through helping me with my work. And uh, just God bless you, Jim. And I'm just so grateful to you, Jim, for the opportunity to bring Mark's story to a lot of people around the world. So God bless you. If you'd like to consider sponsoring a story, folks, and, and taking that step, I would encourage you to do it. There's information in the video description below this video. In the comment section, you can donate to my work. I don't monetize these videos. Uh, there's no commercials. I don't feel that's fair to interrupt these stories. And Or you can go to my website, LarryCapetto.com, and click on Sponsor a Vet. So I know a lot of you are thinking about that. A lot of you would like to help, and God bless you for it. So, Okay, folks, these stories need to be heard today by our younger generation, especially. History is best learned from those who are there. As we continue to fight for our same freedoms in our own country that our veterans fought for on foreign soil, these stories are paramount. They must come forward. Thank you for those of you who are commenting on these videos. It really, I appreciate that. That's the only way I can hear from some of you. And I get about 15, 20,000 views every 48 hours. And uh, I'm just grateful for those that are learning and are really becoming more aware of how important our veterans are and the freedoms they fought for. All right, folks, subscribe to this channel and comment on these videos and share the videos too. I'd greatly appreciate it. Share it with a friend, a loved one, or another veteran. Amen. God bless you. I'm 59. Okay, so 69 and 70, or 19? No, 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 69. Help me with the math. 22. Okay. Born in 47, 69 gets me to 22. Yeah. Okay. Um, were you drafted? Yes. Okay. I've got my degree in 68. Went to work in the business world after my graduation, and my draft status changed, obviously, and within, literally within 12 weeks, I had my notice. So I was inducted right before Christmas of 68. What, what do you remember about the, the mood of the country at the time you went in? Did you feel a, a real sense of duty like the World War II generation did to go fight for your country? Or was it something that you maybe didn't want to do and you just found yourself doing it? Or how did you feel about that time? I guess I felt like I had uh, a job to do. And I was from a conservative enough family that I had the tried and true virtues of my father was in World War II. Um, my grandfather had been in World War I. My uncle was in World War II. So I had a lot of veterans in the family. So the idea of serving was, uh, wasn't anything that was going to be distasteful to me. 
The mood of the country was obvious to anyone that, that has watched or read about that period, the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, it was drugs. There, there was a huge anti-war movement being fomented. In fact, it was probably at, at its height at about the time I was inducted. <clears throat> but it didn't, didn't impact me one way or the other. When I got my notice, I just knew I was going. Mm -hmm. I was lucky because I had my degree. I was a little bit older than most of the kids that were being inducted or drafted at, at age 18 or 19. So I felt I had a little bit of a break over most of them. What was the actual company or regiment that you served with? There's battalion, or give me the breakdown of uh, all that. Alpha Company, 1st uh, Cavalry, 1st Division, 8th Cavalry. What was your MOS? Oh, boy. Uh, I don't remember the number. It was a mort okay, mortarman. Okay. Infantry slash mortarman. Okay. So when you went to Vietnam, obviously this is your first time in a combat situation. Yes. You experienced over there. Do you remember what you <clears throat> felt the first time you got in country, what you smelled, what you saw? I mean, how, what do you remember about that? I guess the best way to explain it is for people that have seen Platoon, and when Charlie Sheen steps off the plane, that's how you feel. You feel like when you walk out into the street here uh, with the same temperature, but the humidity is about 90%. Mm -hmm. And even when you get off the plane at Tan Sanut, everything smells old, moldy, mildewy. Um, it's just, everything's wet. <clears throat> and the blast of heat is the first thing you think about and feel about. I, I wasn't thinking about where I was going, what I was going to do. I knew what I was going to do or where I was going to go. It, it literally was the, the temperature that floored me. Was it like a culture shock being there? <clears throat> was it like what you thought it would be? You find yourself in Vietnam, here I am, you, you're ready to go? Yeah, I don't think I was surprised by anything. I mean, when you go through the training, the basic training and advanced infantry training that, that I went through, you're pretty much prepared for that part of combat. From a cultural standpoint, a lot of guys, myself included, didn't get close to the culture of the country as much as maybe as we would have liked to. I mean, I was able to get into the city and, and into the outskirts and on occasion, but for the most part, I was with other GIs and, and short of interacting with people when I was out in the bush, jungle, <coughs> field, um, I didn't get as much interaction with the Vietnamese culture as I certainly would have liked. What, did, what type of involvement did you have with the Huey helicopters? Were you part of the, the transports in and out of landing zones? Or get, tell me a little bit about your interaction and your, your, your job with that. Okay, I didn't work with helicopters. I was an infantry person. Well, that's what um, I mean. So what my interaction with them was that they brought me in to an LZ landing zone, be it hot or cold, and took us out, which was obviously more, a lot more fun than going in. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> they were our lifeline, as it were, for lack of a better phrase, when we were out in the field. They brought us our food, hot meals on a rare occasion, sea rations, water, mail, um, the occasional warm hams beer, <coughs> the occasional warm coke. Um, when we used to see those Hueys in the air, uh, kind of a great sigh of relief, kind of was expelled by everybody in the field. But the main purpose of the helicopter was to get us in and get us out. How many troops would be on a, a ship going into a landing zone? Well, if you were on a Huey, um, there was a pilot, a co-pilot, two door gunners, and then there were probably half a dozen of us grunts, as we were better known, cavalry Well, troops. that's an interesting word. I've heard that grunt. Define grunt. Infantry. Okay. But where did that name come from? I suspect it came from the grunting that one does when one's humping in the jungle with 120 degrees, 100 percent humidity, uh, scared to death that the next thing you know you're going to be shot and carrying upwards of 80 or 90 pounds on your back. One tends to <laughs> expel hot air, i.e. grunt, <laughs> when, they, when they do that. I'm not quite sure what the derivation of the term was, but it was, that's what we were called. Well, did you have M16? What did you carry? I carried uh, an M16 for a while. I carried uh, an M60 light machine gun for a while. Uh, when I was carrying mortar equipment, I carried a 45 sidearm. 
Um, I carried a, carried a car 15 for on occasion, um, but an M16 for the most most of the time. Can you can you walk me through a combat assault mission or whatever you whatever kind of mission you went on? Just from pickup to to, to the flight to the incoming fire, if there was at times, and if you went into a hot house, you just take me through one of the missions that you went on. Or you did you remember it? Maybe. Well, I tell you, it's been 30 some years, and at my age, memory is one of the first things that goes. Um, well, the first thing I remember is when you board the chopper to go into an LZ, you don't know if it's hot or cold uh, you, when you take off. The first thing you, you think, uh, you feel, is fear. I mean, I'm, I don't care what anybody tells you, how many guys come in and tell me they were never afraid. They're, they're full of it. You're afraid. You get over it, you learn to live with it fairly quickly. But every time you get on one of those birds to get choppered into the field, not knowing if you were going to be able to just walk off and enjoy a walk in the park <clears throat> or if it was going to be hot, until you got there, you had that kind of knot in your stomach. Um, I guess the, the, the best story that I can relate in terms of a, a combat assault was in May of 70, which was right after Nixon proclaimed that we are going into Cambodia. I had been in Cambodia zillions of times <coughs> outside the law, as it were, before he said it was something we were actually going to do. We, uh, we set up on the uh, outskirts of an old abandoned airfield up near Phuc Vinh. And we were sitting on the, the, what was left of the tarmac, which is mainly just red clay. <clears throat> and you just, because we knew we were going into a hot LZ, the whole, everything over there was hot. It was right along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It was where they had caches of weapons, and rice, and food, and hospitals, and bunker complexes, the whole nine yards. There's a kind of a nervous conversation that goes on amongst people. I mean, and it's not about anything serious. No one talks about family, friends, loved ones. You talk about the World Series, or the Super Bowl, or whatever. <clears throat> This was a huge assault. The whole company was going in, about 150 of us. So that takes, because we were all going in at once. Very rarely did you ever go in at once. In a normal combat assault, three or four travelers would take in six guys apiece. So the first 24 or 30 guys on the ground had to secure the LZ. And if it was hot, obviously that was a much tougher job than when you're bringing in 150 guys. <coughs> Boarded the helicopters, took off, and it was about a 20 minute ride. And about halfway there, we got, received notification that it was hot. Um, I guess that the one thing that you remember when you, when you go into one of these things, so one of the things you remember most vividly is how quickly these helicopters can fly straight forward and then how quickly they can descend, get on the ground. And of course, their life's at risk too. So more often than not, they're screaming and yelling at you and in language I probably can't repeat here, to get off my helicopter, <laughs> which is, we understood that. So you get off, you obviously hit the ground as quickly as you can, and you've got that 80 pound pack and all the stuff you're carrying, it's, uh, you kind of go poof, another reason for the term grunt. And you immediately move in the direction that your squad leader is, has told you to, I was a squad leader at that time, uh, to secure a perimeter. Obviously you understand what a perimeter is. This was the biggest combat assault I was ever involved in. Uh, like I say, it was about 150 guys. Um, took us the better part of three hours, because you still can't land 150, 50 or 60 helicopters at the same time. So it's in and out and in and out. Um, by the time all was said and done, we had the landing zone secured and didn't lose anybody. I'm going to digress this for a second. Come back to your knowledge then, or in, or now. Why were why were we in Vietnam? You want the politically correct answer, or no, yeah. I want I want I want your answer. I mean, well, when I was when I was 21 years old, I thought we were there to fight communism, to stop the, the communist hordes from taking over. Now, I'm not sure, uh, in hindsight, granted that it's 2020, that that was ever the political reason that we were there. 
but at least that that's when I was there and when I was doing my job there, that's kind of what you thought. Although, frankly, you didn't think about that very much. You thought about getting through the next day and trying to get home in one piece. The political <sighs> theories at the time, albeit discussed amongst GIs, wasn't a, wasn't a conversation we had very often, other than to say blank the Army or blank Nixon or blank yeah. LBJ or whatever. <clears throat> was there a strong purpose for being there on your part? I mean, were you fighting for God and country, or how did you feel? I mean, was it, or was it just survival? Well, I wasn't fighting for God, because I didn't believe in God. Um, but I was fighting for my country. I was, I was traditional enough to believe that uh, one that lives in a country like this, even back then, had as a duty to defend the country. Um, there are lots of fright truism sayings out there. One I just saw on a computer the other day um, that kind of speaks to this issue. It said, reporters don't, no disrespect, um, make the First Amendment soldiers do. And then like kinds of sayings. So to me, I was fighting for that albeit probably not in the front of my mind, probably more in the back of my mind. It wasn't something I thought about on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you remember the mood of the troops? I mean, you were a squad leader, you said? For about six months, last six months I was so here. So you were giving the orders, basically? That's right. Well, how many in a squad, six or nine? Well, it depended on if yeah. you are taking losses and if you were getting uh, recruits. But on the average, probably eight or nine. And we're fighting the North Vietnamese? Well, we fight it the NVA, VC. Whatever. <clears throat> Few Oceans. What were they using for weapons? Oh, they had it all. I mean, I didn't see uh, heavy armor, tanks and stuff, but they had artillery, they had machine guns, they had AK-47s, they had 82 millimeter mortars, they had some recoilless rifles, uh, they had RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, um, pistols, grenades. I hear the AK-47 has a distinct sound, I mean... Like a cap gun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you knew when you were walking in the jungle and you heard that sound, the next thing you did was hit the ground. I mean, it was just an automatic reaction. You know, as I listen to you guys talk, my mind has been a little preconditioned by movies. I don't watch a lot of movies, but you know, you think of things, and some of the, the pilots I've talked to, I'll ask, you know, was it like the movies? Is it like going into combat with Creedence Clearwater Revival playing? Or, you know, you know how the Hollywood portrays it. Sure. But, you know, on the ground, I mean, in the jungles, um, have you seen anything that portrayed it right uh, as far as a movie or anything? As far as maybe what it could have been like? Oh, I think there are bits and pieces of a lot of films <coughs> and a lot of novels and a lot of um, books that have been written that purport to tell a, the story of somebody uh, in the jungle. Um, yeah, I mean, there are bits and pieces. I, though I mentioned Platoon before. I guess of all the, the Vietnam flicks, that one, more often than not, kind of gets it right. But as all of his owners want to do, he tends to overdo it sometimes. And he did it in, in that film, too. But the... I guess as I watched that movie, the thing I remember most that, that harkened back to my experiences there was uh, one of the first scenes uh, after Charlie Sheen's in the field is they're set up at a night perimeter and the, the darkness, it just, it's amazing. You cannot literally see your hand in front of your face. It's, it's amazing. <clears throat> it's like being in hell. It's deathly quiet and you just can't see anything. So that those parts of films that, that got that right, and you know, they, there are other pieces of other films that I suppose have, have hit the nail on the head. Um, what, what do you think the hardest part of your tour over there was? Uh, something you saw or experienced? What was the toughest part of what you, you experienced in Vietnam? That's a tough question. The whole thing, I suppose, is a is a one year long event kind of, at least now, kind of all folds into one thing. <coughs> Killing was probably the hardest thing. I never killed anybody until I went over there. I mean, I wasn't a, I wasn't a hunter. I haven't been hunting since I came back. <coughs> um, I wasn't a gun guy. 
Uh, I suppose that's the thing that's hardest to do, notwithstanding that it's kind of a reaction. It just It's fairly natural. Um, and it's the hardest thing to have lived with for all these years since then. Do you think your training prepared you for what you experienced, or, or can you be trained enough to experience? I mean, some of the guys felt invincible. They got over there, and reality set in. And um, How did you feel, Mark? Um, did the training prepare you for what you had to experience, or are there are things you learn in battle conditions that you can't learn anywhere else? Well, the training teaches you the basics, how to fire your weapon, how to do the stuff you're supposed to do to get from one place to the other and, and all that stuff that in combat tends to be fairly unimportant. So the guys that told you that they probably learned more on an OJT basis were probably telling you the truth. You, and obviously in that kind of a scenario, in that kind of a situation, even the dumbest guy learns fast. <clears throat> I mean, you pick up stuff that you learn from guys that have been there a long time, and it doesn't tend to be the kind of thing that you learned back at Fort Jackson in South Carolina. It's, it's, it, OJT is the best way to put it, I guess. You, you survive by what you learn, and truth be told, there is a certain amount of luck involved. <clears throat> Engaging the enemy in Vietnam, um, Close range, Art were there any artillery? I don't hear a whole lot of artillery. I mean, this basic small arms exchange, is that pretty much what you guys are doing? Yeah, they had some artillery, some recoilless rifle. Uh, I'm not sure I encountered it more than half a dozen times in a year. Mainly small arms fire, uh, rocket propel grenades, uh, Chinese communist grenades, the things that look like pineapples. Um, 82 millimeter mortars, uh, they had a it's like a 50 caliber machine gun, which they would set up on a, an old Jeep or something, which was, was brutal. But it was mainly small arms fire. Some hand-to-hand, -hand, but not a lot. I don't know what, what a lot is, but once would be too so much. you guys <laughs> fix bayonets and the whole bit? I mean, when you say Rarely. Hand -hand, Rarely. Yeah. Okay. But uh, on occasion, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, you know, living with these memories. I mean, was there a time that it was bothered you or did you come home forget the war and go on with your life or I came home and got on with my life Sandy will tell you we've been married 15 years and I've never never talked about it um, <clears throat> did you read the article that was in the East Valley Tribune is that what brought you to to find out about my work or what were you uh, it wasn't an article it was just a well, short well, blurb yeah, it was a short yeah. Brief. yeah yeah why do you think you responded to that? I mean, what, did Sandy encourage you, or did you, did you see No, she didn't. I did it myself in the hopes that maybe I could. And I'm not a person that doesn't sleep at night and has, I have dreams and I have nightmares, yes. Um, but I thought perhaps if I could get through something like this, I could, this is going to sound hokey as hell, be a better husband and show a little more emotion and, and be a, maybe a little warmer person. When I first came back, um, to answer your question about reactions, um, I told you not to cry. <clears throat> uh, I was previously married, um, and this is a true story. On the mantle of our bed, I had a bunch of athletic trophies, and my wife at the time woke up. This is maybe eight months after I've been back, and I had trophy in my hand with the marble base ready to hit her in the head. Thank God she woke up. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, you have those kind of things. But that's the only time that ever happened. Never happened again. Um, I don't think about the war every day. I, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't drive me one way or the other. But it's certainly something that defined my life and the way I live my life. How do you think it changed the way you live? I mean, going through combat, obviously, will change a person. Um, the training, having talked to all these World War II veterans and what they went through at 19 years of age, um, does it give you a new lease on life to be around that? I mean, you obviously have lived your life. You went through that experience. Um, did it make you a better person? Well, I think it made me a better person, yeah. I think it. it it helped. It wasn't just 
my experience in the war, a lot of the way you live your life has to do with the way you've grown, the way you grew up, the mores that your parents put into you and instill in you. But I do think it helped me become a better man uh, and one that looked at life through something other than rose-colored glasses. I look at life with a fairly realistic, through a fairly realistic prism. I mean, I, I know what life's like, and, and I suppose if it's looking for one word definition, it's probably cynical. I, I think a lot of combats that you talk to will tend to get that way. I tell you, they tend to get that way. And that's kind of how I should have phrased that. It probably <coughs> makes you think or look at life differently, having through, been through combat, you know, like you said. Um, your perception of what life is. Well, you look, I mean, from an esoteric standpoint, sure. I mean, we all know what life is. We've all, in this room, lived 40, 50 years. Um, a lot of guys I was with, I was walking down a trail one minute, and the next minute they were gone. And that's the kind of thought process you go through when you're there. Don't think about it. I didn't think about it much after I came back. I mean, you tend, I tended to box it up, crate it up, put it away like lots of guys did and move on in my life. I didn't take drugs, I didn't commit crimes, I worked in a business place for 40 years and moved on. Did you lose friends over there, Mark? Killed, wounded while you were in Vietnam? I did. <clears throat> but you want stories? No, I'm just asking. Yeah, I... Uh, well, you mentioned some guy was there and the next minute he was gone. I mean, when we, was that like a mortar it, round? It was, no, it was after our incursion into Cambodia, um, one of my best friends, a um, kid from Alabama, talked just like that too. His nickname was, his last name was Dill, so we nicknamed him Pickles. <coughs> well, we had moved on from where we, where we, uh, where we came in, and we were set up on a, on a trail, which you normally didn't do. <coughs> and pardon the story, but he had to go do his business. And he started to walk down the trail, and he didn't go 20 yards, and he was dead. Two VC had to be coming around the corner. So yeah, you just kinda, you just, one minute you were there joking, and the next minute you were putting him on a helicopter, hoping he'd make it. And then getting the word 20 minutes later that he did. I'm fascinated with the Huey helicopters, just like I was with the, the Higgins boats that took the World War II guys into to combat. You know, <coughs> The, the uh, mode of transport. Um, did the Huey have the doors? You know, I hear the doors run on the Hueys. Is that kind of how it was? You hang out, or or were you know the ones that you wanted? Yeah, for 99.9% .9 of the ones didn't have the doors on. You could fit an extra guy, or maybe even two in that way. Plus, <coughs> excuse me, the door gunners had to have room to maneuver their their machine gun. So yeah, most of them didn't have doors. Was it pretty mm. noisy? In oh yes, it was pretty noisy. So you're not talking. Well, if you are, you're not talking, you're screaming. Now, once you got off the ground, up into clear space, as it were, it's, it's a little quiet, but still, with the whirling of the, of the rotor, it's pretty loud. The very distinct sound of that... Poof, Every walk. machine there had a distinct sound. You knew if a Huey was coming, you knew if a Chinook was coming, which was the helicopter with two mm -hmm. rotors on either end. You knew if a Cobra was coming, a gunship. Um, you knew if a B-52 was coming to drop their loads. Um, you knew if a Loach helicopter, which is the one-man scouting chopper, was coming. <coughs> it sounded like one of those toys you take out of the park. Uh, so yeah, every, every machine you knew, you knew what it was instantaneously. And then that's one of the things I guess I remember more than anything else is that you, you long to hear that you long to hear that B-52 when you were in the middle of a hell of a firefight, and then, or you were surrounded, or you were in trouble, and you knew if they dropped their payloads where they were supposed to, which they didn't always, but um, you probably were going to be okay. Can you just tell uh. me a little bit more about combat? You mentioned a firefight. I mean, where were you? What happened? What's going on? I mean, is it a, a, a short engagement? Was it several days? Um, were you taking a hill? <coughs> what are you doing? Well, I, we could go on for days about it. I mean. Some were, some were very short, five, ten minutes. Um, those were mainly ambushes where the enemy had set up an ambush and had 
picked off two or three guys or, or something, some specific target that they had in mind, which is usually a squad leader or a platoon leader or the radio guy. The radio guy was always a target. You could tell because that big radio on his back. <clears throat> Others were more protracted. Um, most firefights occurred between uh, um, a number of people on either side, I'm having trouble expressing myself here, a, a platoon of Americans, 30, 40 guys, and like number of VC or NVA. So those tended to be fairly short, fairly brief, not a lot of military strategy involved. It was shoot, 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 and someone would, would leave, would deed him out. Other combat situations would become more protracted. Um, the taking of a hill, for example, that's not something that you do uh, in five or ten minutes. I mean, sometimes that's something you don't do, period. Uh, and then there were some, although very infrequent, that lasted for a couple of days. Those were taking of hills or where two large groups encountered each other, a battalion versus a battalion. That, that then became a fairly stout combat. <clears throat> What about the camaraderie that you guys shared? Was it pretty, was there a bond there between you guys? I mean. Yes. I mean, I'm sure everyone that you've talked to has told you that. You developed friends and friendships. Um, I won't say instantaneously because that's not the truth, but you developed some very close friends very quickly. Um, and yet, I can honestly say, I haven't seen one of the guys I served with since I came mm -hmm. back. But that's not me. I just, I moved on. <clears throat> but yeah, you get very close. I mean, I maintain, I write to guys, I get Christmas cards, and you know, that kind of thing. But we, I don't go to reunions and those kind of things. But when you're there, oh yeah, you get, you get as close to some guys as you probably get to your spouse. In fact, you may tell them things, I've told, I should tell you, <laughs> I've told guys, those guys, some of those guys when I was over there, more than I've ever told her. But that's just the way you do things. It's a, it's a, it's a way to vent. It's a way to kind of get re release some of your pent up emotions. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you you get close and you get close fast. Some guys got close to lots of people. I mean, they're outgoing, friendly, extroverted types. That wasn't me. I was just the opposite. But I mean, I made some good friends there. Some of the <laughs> Vietnam vets are very uh, visual with hats and pins and medals. I, I'll notice you don't have anything. Um, <coughs> do, do you think some of the vets are, are still living that war 40 years later? I mean, it seems like a lot of them are still very much involved in, in what had happened. And I know a lot of them had problems when they came back, and I've heard they didn't get the help they need. I don't know. One of my questions to you, were there drugs in Vietnam? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I never used them. Um, but. I didn't use them in college either, so I wasn't a druggie. Um, there were drugs there. Um, in my situation, perhaps not as many as what some of the other guys you may interview saw, um, but there was some heroin use and there was a lot of marijuana use. Um, yeah, I don't wear hats and my medals. I don't, that, that just like I say, I, I, it's in a box and I put it away when I came home. And, and I don't disrespect those guys that still live it. I mean, we're all, for lack of a better phrase, we're all still there. We always will still be there. <clears throat> Some guys just dealt with it differently. I won't say better than us. Some guys just dealt with it differently, that's all. Do you think the drug usage was a result of the culture <coughs> here and that's why it was there? Or would you think it was an escape from some of the things that these men saw? Well, I think it's probably a combination of all of those things. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced it was partially because drugs were part of the culture here. I mean, whether you were in college, whether you were in high school, whether you were on the athletic field, or whether you were on the streets. I mean, drugs were a big part in the 60s. Um, and so I think part of that carried over when guys went over there. But I also think that part of it was driven by what guys had to do and had to see. And I shouldn't just say guys because there were women there, but they weren't on the front line. So pardon me if I'm not being PC, but <clears throat> it's a, it was a guy thing. <laughs> but yeah, there was, there was a lot of drugs, but 
in the cosmic scheme of things, probably not, at least from my perspective, not as much as, as they would have you believe in terms of what you see in the movies and on TV and that kind of thing. But it was there. It's interesting talking to the World War II generation and the things that they experienced and, you know, what you guys experienced in Vietnam. Um, I try to find things that are similar, things that are different, but um, you, can, you can see a shift from World War II into Korea. A lot of the Korean veterans have told me they went into Korea with a uh, World War II mentality and things have started to change. The p politics got involved and in Vietnam. And uh, Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes. Oh yeah, I don't hide it. Um, I'm glad I did what I did. Um, uh, at the time, I never thought about going to Canada or I was going to do my thing and I'm, I'm proud that I did. Have people thanked you for serving our country? Interesting question. <clears throat> Only because of the timing. Um, I got spit on a couple of times when I came back. I came back through um, Travis Air Force Base in Oakland. and uh, So I spent some time in San Francisco. And that was not the best place to come through at that time of <laughs> my life in, in that situation. And nobody for... Well, I came back in July of 70, ever thanked me, and I never expected it. And then when we left Wausau in, right after April 1st, right after April Fool's Day, um, squirrely story, the mover, moving truck wouldn't take her plants. They, they can't cross the Continental Divide, yada, yada. So we took them to a neighbor down the street who we'd lived next to for the four years we were there. And he was, he and they we were in their 70s. Um, he turned out to have been a World War II and a Korean veteran. And uh, lived next to him for four years, and he didn't know I was in Nam, and I didn't know he was a uh, I happened to have a Vietnam hat on that day, because it was cold out. We were moving the plants in, and he just asked me, because he saw the hat, and he said, were you there? And I said, yeah, I was there. And he immediately shook his, stuck his hand out and said, thank you for your service. I mean, I almost cried. It was amazing. First time in 30-something years. But. And that's not anything I ever expected either, so. But it, that was nice, I got to admit. But he, having been in combat, knew what, what it was about. What, what do you think happened in 20, 25 years after World War II, where the country was so united and, you know, the homecoming was so overwhelming and everybody supported it? What do you think happened in those years? I mean, and then you guys get spit on and stuff thrown at you and called baby killers and whatever. It is. Well, I guess if you're a history student, which I was, I mean, it's pure and simply politics. World War II was the right war. Korea was the right war. In a different sense, but it, it was the right war. It was supported. We were doing the right thing there. And notwithstanding that perhaps the guys in, in Vietnam in the early 60s, up to maybe 65, had the, the majority of the country behind them, obviously that culture changed. And I think that's what changed. I think that's the difference between the two previous wars and this one, and I think we're obviously still dealing with it. I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever, ever, ever get over dealing with it. Not, I'm not dealing with it. Bill Clinton dealt with it. George Bush is dealing with it. And whoever takes Bush's place is going to have to deal with it because there is a certain, not to get off on a political tangent here, but there is a Vietnamization syndrome, I think, in the government now that precludes us from winning a war. Notwithstanding that wars have changed, obviously. I mean, Vietnam was a far different war. It was a guerrilla war, and so is the one that's going on now, whereas the two previous wars were, tended to be more classical combat situations. Not that I'm a military scientist or anything, but <laughs> I think that's part of what happened. And I think from a historical perspective, uh, we still have a lot to learn from the two big wars, the two wars that were, were properly thought of as being fought for the right reason, and this one that we're in now, which slowly, in my humble opinion, but surely is heading down the road of, of what happened in, with Vietnam. I can't imagine there won't be people on Pennsylvania Avenue someday with signs, bring our boys home. I mean, seriously. <clears throat> what, what does Vietnam mean to you today? What significance does it have in your life? I guess the main significance is that it was 
the defining year of my life. And now that I look back on it after 60 years on the planet almost, and think, what a strange thing to have you, the, the defining year of your life a third of the way through your life. I mean, not that I, I've lived a great life, I've had a great career, I've done a lot of, a lot of great stuff, I've traveled a lot, but that, that one year tends to define, tended to define me, I shouldn't, I should be specific, tended to define me and the way I lived my life and handled my career. Um, I'm not sure that's a bad thing, but it certainly was something that at the time I didn't understand and didn't appreciate. It, it, even though I was a little bit older than most of the kids that were there, I was still only 22. <clears throat> what do you want people to remember about Vietnam? Well, if I sat here and gave you the trite old cliche of that Vietnam vets should have been, or at least now should be treated the way World War II vets and Korean War vets and guys coming back from Iraq were, I'm not naive enough to think that that's ever going to happen. And I think it's so far after the fact that it's phony anyway. So, you know, I don't buy it in the first place. I guess the main thing that people should remember is we're supposed to learn from history. Right? Well, then let's learn culturally, politically, socially, and militarily the lessons of that war. And I'm not, I won't go through all of them, but I think there are certainly a lot of lessons that can be learned from those wars, particularly politically and militarily. What does the American flag mean to you and represent to you as a veteran? <sighs> Symbol of what's right about this country. Um, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all those things. Um, and I hope and pray that they don't pass an amendment that bans flag burning. It's what we fought for. <clears throat> How about freedom? What does freedom mean, or what is freedom to you? I guess it's, it's fairly simple. It's the ability to do what I want, when I want, the way I want, within the confines of the strictures society sets, be they moral, cultural, legal. <clears throat> Sometimes a lot of hyperbole involved with freedom and, and defining it. There are a lot of free societies. <clears throat> Ours, I guess, is freer, again, for lack of a better phrase, because of what veterans have gone through, have accomplished over the last 300 years. I don't go to bed worrying about freedom and thinking about freedom. It's one of those things, I guess, that's in the back of your mind. Um, but I also don't just think about it on July 4th, the Memorial Day, or Veterans Day. Well, you saw people wounded and killed in combat. <clears throat> what would you tell a young person today about the price of freedom? I'm not sure I could tell a young person uh, anything. Um, I mean, I could tell them what I saw and how I relate what I saw and what I did to their ability to to be free, again, for lack of a better phrase. But, and call me cynical and call me not looking through rose-colored glasses, but uh, the younger generation, in my humble opinion, and I've hired and fired a lot of them in my career, don't appreciate the freedom as, as we're discussing it here, um, even the way our generation did, and certainly previous generations. I'm not sure I could educate them about it um, because having been in their shoes, had they done that to me, I probably would have said, ah, you're pontificating again, get off it. You know? <clears throat> and I think that's kind of the attitude you tend to get. Uh, they got to get some years on them, I think. Experience, living life, sometimes is the only way they're going to learn that 
freedom is more than just a seven letter word. I didn't explain that very well, but. <laughs> Fine. Um, have you ever been back to Washington, D.C. At, at the wall there? Several times. Can you tell me what you felt the first time you were there? I think that was the first time I shed a tear since I came back. Um, and I, as most guys do, I looked specifically for guys that I had known that didn't make it back. Um, but I can also remember, because I didn't see it at, until it had been up for f four or five years. And so I watched all of the publicity about it when it was being, when the bids were going out. Um, and I thought, like a, guy, a lot of guys did, I guess, my God, what is this abomination? And then when I first saw it, It was like a light went on. I said, this is, this is exactly what was necessary. I mean, it's, it's thoughtful, it's deep, it's, and it's so different from the other memorials on the mall, particularly, um, that I thought that they hit just the right note. And I've been back a couple times since. Anything else that maybe I didn't ask you that you thought that I might ask you or that you would like to share um, about Vietnam, combat, your part as a veteran? I mean, anything that maybe I haven't asked you? I want to make sure that you've gotten out what you think you want to talk about. Uh, I think I pretty much said my piece. I mean, I could sit here and tell you stories. Well, you're with but the that's first Cap, right? Yes. Can you, can you give me just a brief history of that? Um, I can't give you a history of the first cab, no. <laughs> you guys were the horse, I mean, the, the, the patch, you know, got the horse on there, right? Am I you talking about the, the right horse way? they never rode, the line they never crossed, and the yellow collar down their back, yeah. <clears throat> I think that was a, and generated in Korea. <clears throat> Hopefully we, we fixed that within the last war. Yeah, I think they were, and still are, based out of Fort Hood, Texas. And were obviously the first division on horseback and became known as the Air Mobile Division in Vietnam and were the first to have as many helicopters at its disposal. Now, not that other divisions didn't. The first division had it and uh, the Americal had them, but we had them to the point where over the course of the 365-day tour, if you were in the field for 12 months like I was, you probably would compete 50 to 75 combat missions. Um, but those helicopters, which I know is the main focus that you want to hit on, were a lifeline for us. I mean, and of all of them, the guys I guess that deserve the most respect, and if you ever get any of these guys that flew medevac choppers in here, those guys, <laughs> deserve a pat on the back and a handshake because they flew into some situations that you, that you would have never thought they would have had a chance to get out of. Um, they had guts and we'd, we'd get it, suffer a wound, uh, a KIA, God forbid, and if we were in the middle of the jungle, there's no place for them to set down, we'd have to clear place within the land. Well, obviously, with the rotors on those things extending 40, 45 feet, whatever it was, you had to clear a lot of jungle away. <coughs> but you know you didn't have the freedom of time because the enemy was around, obviously. They could set those things down on that table. I mean, they were, they were good, and we appreciated what they did. <coughs> were there helicopters that would go in before an assault and clear that area out? Would ground troops clear out an LZ or how does... Well, I can say we created some LZs. Now, other LZs, I mean, an LZ was a term that was used in, in lots of contexts. Um, we would combat assault onto an LZ, which could be nothing more than a field of elephant grass or a paddy, rice paddy, or a hill or whatever it was. Uh, on landing zone, or LZs were also um, semi-permanent encampments that were built out in the field um, that would encompass two or three hundred acres. We would have a huge perimeter with 
wire around it and um, artillery on it and bunkers every 40 or 50 feet and they were there for anywhere from two or three weeks to two or three months. <clears throat> from whence, from where a lot of these helicopters would take off, get supplied, come out to us in the field and then come back. <clears throat> and I guess I've, I've forgotten even what your question was. Oh, we're talking about the air cab, the air mobile yeah. division, you know, the inception of that. And, uh, and I guess in 65 is when Johnson first ordered the, the air mobile division to Vietnam. And then I believe that's right. I drank, we see the movie, We Were Soldiers mm -hmm. and the whole thing. Sure. Um, and so we learn a little bit about the air cavalry. Um, fascinating. Um, just the type of warfare that was. And I'm sure what, it, what the enemy experienced when the helicopters came in. And I've asked some of the pilots, you know, questions about the hydraulics of the, of the ships and, you know, if I was shooting a helicopter, what, you, what are you aiming for? I mean, did you take fire in, in the ships that you went into? To when we were on ships? Yeah. Oh, sure. Was it like a ping ping or was it a boom? I mean, what do you remember? <laughs> well, it was a ping ping for the most part because most of the time they hit the underneath the belly of the helicopter, which was, was steel. Um, but that was scary because, yeah, I guess if they, I'm not a pilot, but I assume if they hit a certain part of the rotor or the tail, rotor, uh, at least from what I've, a little bit I know about flying, those things didn't stay in the air very long and they tended to just kind of go straight down and with all the fuel in them, I mean, that you didn't tend to get out of those alive, um, which was why we loved and respected the pilots so much because more often than not, they were flying, whether it was a heli medic, medevac helicopter or guys just bringing us in and out of an LZ, I mean, uh, those guys had life expectancies about the same as a second lieutenant in the field. I mean, wasn't good. They had a lot of guts, took a lot of chances. Are there sights and sounds today or smells that bring back Vietnam? Well, when, when a Huey flies overhead here, whether it's a Channel 3 or Channel 5 um, news chopper or weather chopper, um, occasionally it might bring back. but. Frankly, no, I don't dwell on what I went through back then. Um, I say I kind of was done with it. I still dream about it once in a while, think about it, but the, the smells were so peculiar to that one year that they don't translate or transfer to this part of the world. I mean, mildew smells like mildew, but there it was... I mean, it was just, it was just different. And humidity is humidity. I lived in the South for a while, and but yet, humidity in Florida is nothing like humidity in the, in the jungle uh, when you're in Guan Loi, Song Bay, one of those places. You just, it's it's hard to breathe. So those are the kind of things I think I remember sometimes. But in terms of translating that back to here, that doesn't happen very often. Do you think it's important that we remember some of these things about war? Vietnam? Well, I think it's, it's obvious it's important to remember things about war if only because we would hope down the road at some time that there will never be any. I'm not naive enough to think that's the case given what's happening in the Middle East today, but I guess if I put on my rose-colored glasses for once, I would like to think that at some point in time this world would get to that point where we could all put the rifles down and put them into plowshares and plant corn and walk down the road arm in arm <laughs> singing kumbaya. Don't expect that's going to happen, but <laughs> I guess I'm hopeful. Um, I think you've covered it pretty well. Um, I have one more. Oh, I was going to ask you, have you talked to Sandy much about Vietnam? She's heard more in the last hour than she's heard in 15 years. <clears throat> you know, I, I'd say 75% of the veterans that I talk to have, have never shared or shared in depth what happened in combat. And oh, uh, sure. it's amazing to me when somebody will say just what you said. And even with 60 years ago with the World War II generation, it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, the guy that was here before had a little article cut out of the paper and he wanted it back. He wanted to keep it. It meant a lot to him. And uh, 
I just think it's important that we, we record these stories um, before it's too late to do so. I guess you wouldn't be here if you didn't think so. <laughs> and I'm just, I guess the iron, irony in what I do is that I've never served in the military, and yet I feel like this project is, is serving my country right now. Oh, I appreciate that, and I think it's, it's I think it's well worth doing. Um, and don't just, you're doing, I know you've done World War II and you've done Korea. Um, don't just concentrate on the one on our war because a lot of guys have fought in a lot of wars that meant, if not more, at least as much as the one I fought. I mean, everyone thinks the war they fought in was the most important, but I'm not sure I'm naive enough to think that either. But. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not just focusing. I'm, I'm working on my fourth World War II film, and I'm just <clears throat> beginning to work with the Korea and the Vietnam bits, but what's happening is I'm getting a lot of Vietnam bits now, and it's, it's exciting. It's, it's amazing. Well, I would imagine. You guys are so young. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, for once, right. I may not be the oldest guy in the room. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing. I found the secret to youth. You know, finding men in their 80s and talking with them. And Lewis is really my—he's my adopted father. I lost my father when I was 10. So, oh, I'm sorry. And he was an alcoholic, so I remember nothing about him, other than the bad stuff. But. He's taken on the role as my father, and I made him sign a 20-year contract. Uh -huh. to work with me. So, <coughs> so you drove along with him. Yeah. Oh. I got out of hand. I bet he's had an influence on what you're doing. Oh, amazing. <laughs> you know, I interviewed Lou three years ago in Denver, and uh, we've become really good friends. And he just lost his wife in January, and he's made it his mission to travel with me now. And good for him. It's just an amazing thing. 59 years. <clears throat> We can talk a little bit more. I'm going to do, ask you to do one more thing. I've asked all the veterans, and I hope and pray that you're going to do this for me. But when I say, can you give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated right there? And if you saw one of my films, you probably would understand this, but I'm going to. Okay, Mark, right in the camera. <laughs>